and obey God tonight, my brother, in Jesus' name. Bless him. Let's give him a hand clap tonight. I would do better if I spoke like there was 10. I'm very, a lot more used to that. But I feel like that I'm in the place of God tonight. I want to talk to you tonight about a balanced spiritual life. I, and that's sort of what the songs were about. And I think it's important that... I'm not used, I'm not used to holding the mic. Um, I think it's important that, that we have a good relationship with God or that God will call us a friend. I want God to call me a friend. I can, that's Mark 9 and 29, And Jesus said unto them, This can, can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. So that's the end of the scripture, so you can sit back down. Thank you. <laughs> In 1974, uh, I'd served God. I lived for God all my life, and Jesus filled me with the Holy Ghost after running me out of the church that I was in. And when I got the Holy Ghost, I mean, I was up on the mountaintop for three solid months. And I kept telling my friends, Larry and Lenny, they were my first friends after, the, that we got in the, after I got into church. I said, do you ever come down off this mountain? You'll come down. You'll come down. And I kept not asking him again, do you ever come down off this mountain? I like it up here. Because I had found a place in God that I did not know existed. I had found joy in God that I did not know existed. And when I read the Word, it was like the Word would, would literally come alive. And, uh, and, you know, finally when I did come down, you know, I, I sort of liked it up there. So I, I, started, to, I started saying, you know, I wanted, I wanted to be back up there. So I started looking into His Word. And when you want answers from God... You need to look in his word. There's always answers in his word, you know, that tells us how that we should live. And when I did, he gave me a, a great desire to pray. Nobody told me that, that I need to pray for an hour a day, but it was like it was in my spirit. I need to pray for an hour a day. And all my life, you know, even though that I had stood and preached, I had never felt like that. Uh, and, and so... I uh, started doing it, and when you look in, when you look in the Word, uh, Moses, when he went up on the mountain to be with God in, in Exodus 34 chapter and the 28th verse, Moses went up on the mountain, and he, all he did, he, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he talked with God, and God talked with him. Can I tell you tonight that God wants to have communion and fellowship with you, and it's important that we align ourselves up with the Word of God so that we can have that. And, and, and then I looked in the book of James, the fifth chapter, and it said that Eli, Elijah pr prayed, and it rained not by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and rain came, and there was great, you know, the, the fruits came again. So it, it, when we look in there, and Solomon prayed for wisdom when, God, when they made him king. He prayed, his prayer was, Lord, give me wisdom that I may walk in and out among your people and judge righteously between them. And God told him, he said, you know, because, said, I'm going to do that, but because that you did not ask for riches, I'm going to give you riches also. So, you know, when we ask for the right thing, I think that God rewards us greatly when we're not selfish and we don't need to be selfish. And God also told him that, uh, that any time that people praise towards the temple of God, that God would hear their prayer. Uh, and I, I think it's, it was that temple that Daniel was praying towards when he raised in wonder three times a day and he prayed. And, and the only thing, only thing that they could find that wrong with Daniel when they looked at all of his life and the only thing they could find wrong with him is that he would raise that wonder and he'd pray to his God three times a day. You know, I wish that was all the accusation that they could bring against me. And then we, uh, we look, you know, they, they said, History tells us that they called the Apostle John Camel's Knees because he prayed so much. He stayed on his knees all the time. And in, during the early revivals of the early 1900s, there was an evangelist in Arkansas. They said he would pray seven and eight hours a day. It, it is very important that we pray. And so I, de I decided I was going to start praying, and I started praying, and the joy started coming back up. 
And the joy started coming back up, and it lasted for a while, and it started dwindling back down. And uh, you know, I came back down off the mountain, and uh, and so I started to, again. I went to His Word, and went to His Word. And in Psalms 138 and two, it says, "His Word is above all His name." You know, we as Pentecostals really like to use that name a lot, but it says that this Word is above all of His name. And that's important for us to remember that we dig in this word, that we study this word, that, that we memorize this word, that, you know, that we read this word. It, it's important that, that we do that. Um, in, in, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 3 and 21, the Bible says that God revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And this was a time... You know, when God would, you know, he would talk to people, you know, like he did Moses and Abraham. But, but God revealed himself through his word. And if you look in that word, God, he will reveal himself to us through that word. The word is extremely important to us. In Ephesians, it's, it states that we're washed, we're cleansed by the washing of the word. So, you know, and, and there are times when, the, you know, our mind gets out of whack and, we need to be washed by the word. The word needs to remind us. And it takes the foolishness of preaching to save us, you know. You know, we need to be listening to the preaching of the word at all times. In Revelation 1 and 3, it states that when we, just, when we just read this word, that we're blessed. You want to be blessed? Read this word. Obey this word. You want to be blessed? Read this word. In Psalm 78 and 2, it says that God will... He will he will guide us with the skillfulness of his hand. He will feed us with the integrity of his heart. And he will guide us along with the skillfulness of his hand. Not according to our ability. Not according to somebody else's ability that you know. But according to his ability. It's important that we understand that. Uh, and it said in Hosea 4 and 6 it says, My people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. You know, when, you, when we get in situation, we don't know what, what the Word says, then it, we can be destroyed by the lack of knowledge. But if we dig in this Word and we know what the Word says, it, it, you know, the Word will, will touch us. We had this guy out at federal prison. He was a Spanish guy, and he said that when, right before he got in church, he started reading the Word. And he said he liked going to the prostitute's house, and so he started reading in Proverbs. He said, I read, and it said, don't even go into their houses. He said, I got mad at the word. The word was talking to me. This word will talk to you if you read it and if you listen to it and you obey it. And then at the other church we was at, we had a, the Reverend Dr. Clay Jackson. He used to ride with me to church when we would have meetings and he told me one day, he said, uh, you know, I, I was in Bible quiz, and he said, when I went to England, uh, I forgot what, what college he said that he went to, but he said, they told me, you need to memorize this three pages. He said, piece of cake. He said, when I, when, when I was memorizing the Word of God, it, it, it sharpened my mind, and it honed my mind. And our grandkids are is nine years old now, little Zoe and little Zachy, and they, this year they memorized for, for the Bible quiz, and they memorized 175 verses, and they won. And they won the state championship for the state of Arkansas. They go to nationals next month. But anyway, about a month ago, my daughter said that little Zachy walked in the room and said, Mama, I can memorize those scriptures a lot easier now than I could when I first started doing it. So, you know, it, helps, it also helps your mind when you memorize them. And, uh, and so slowly again, I got to where I was, you know, I, I got back up on the mountain. I like it when I've been up on the mountain. You know, I don't like it when I get down in the valley, and I have been in a few valleys in my lifetime. But I have learned to walk by faith and, and not by sight. And actuality is Pentecostal. I've learned to walk by faith and not by feelings. You know, sometimes we as Pentecostals like to walk by our feelings when we can't feel God. And I like feeling God.
But I know that we need to walk by faith and, and not by our own feelings. Because your feelings will deserve, they will, they will trick you up. And, and so I they got back up on the mountain for a while. I stayed there. And, and then all of a sudden I started dwindling back down. And so again, I go back to this word and start reading this word for direction in my life. The Bible says the steps of a good man are order of the Lord. I want my step to be order of the Lord. I want the new people to be order, their steps to be order of the Lord. And I want them to be learn how to live for God right. And so I go and I look, start looking again. And uh, I look at Moses, again Moses, fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And I would tell you that if you're going to try to do that, I would, I would not suggest that you try to do that unless you consult a doctor and maybe your pastor. I've never done that before. Uh, but Moses did. And when he came down off the mountain, the Bible says his face was shining. It shone, and they had to put a veil over his face because of the presence of God that was coming through him. You know, there are times when we hear instances where people... You know, they, they will walk up to some of our people and they, they, will, they will see the presence of God that's coming through them. And, you know, it's important that we stay right with God so that, that people will see, will see God living in us. My wife told me not to pull my coat off, but I'm going to do it. I don't want to pass out. <laughs> I passed out in the, in the Sunday school room one day. Um, and when we look in the book of Esther, when... When they were, uh, um, the king was going to, he was going to annihilate all of the Jewish race. And Mordecai told Esther, he said, he sent word to Esther, you, you're in the king, you're going to be included in this too, you'll get wiped out too. There won't be any more Jews left in the land. And she sent word back to Mordecai, and this was what she told Mordecai, he, she said, I and all of my, my staff, the ones that takes care of me, we're going to fast day and night until I go before the king. And if he holds the sepulchre out, then that will be good. And said, But if I perish, I perish. You know, we need to have that attitude about living for God. If I perish, I perish. And so they did. And, and when he, she went before the king because that they had sought the face of God. You know, when we have hard times... More than anything else, we need to seek the face of God, not going and looking down for counselors. I think in the book of Isaiah, it says, you know, you look for your counselors, and where are they, you know? Have they ever helped you out of anything? The counselors, you know, sometimes they can help people a little bit, but there is nothing that our God cannot do. And so he helped, he helped the sepulcher out. And... and and because, of, you know, they were willing to seek the face of God and they were willing to fast and pray, the whole Jewish nation was saved because of one woman that was willing to say, if I perish, I perish. Uh, and then in Samuel, the second Samuel, the 12th chapter, when, when David, you know, when all the kings were out to war and David staying home, I don't know why he stayed home, but he was, he was looking out over the roof at night and he saw Bathsheba bathing and he sent for her and he had a relationship with her and then they had a child and he sent and had her husband put in the forefront of the, of the, the army and had him where he would be killed. And, and then God told, told the prophet, you know, I'm going to destroy the baby because of this. The Bible says that David fasted until, you know, all night long and without food or without water because he knew that there was a pattern in the scriptures where that if he did this, that maybe God would hear his voice. And then the baby died. And they said they, he got up and says, fix me food to eat and water, you know, something to drink. They said, why did you do this? He said, well, while the baby was yet alive, there was a chance that God would hear my prayers and save the baby. And, it, uh, and, and we go on and we look at that. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, uh, I think we got time. Let's, let's just look there. It, it's a very... Very interesting scripture. When Jesus was tempted in Matthew the fourth chapter, then was Jesus led up in the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. 
And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And can I tell you that he's always going to tell you it, when you make a mistake or you know anything, he's going to tell you if you was really the Son of God, you, this would happen. That's a trick that he plays on every one of us. And I don't know why, but he's still dumb enough to play that trick on us today. If you was really the Son of God, you wouldn't be making this mistake. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh them to a holy city, and set him in the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, there he is again. Cast thyself down, for it is written. And here's Satan quoting the scriptures. Satan knows how to quote scriptures against you. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of, the th of them. He said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. The best way to fight the devil off is through the word of God. And some of my best things that I like to say is, you know, I went, my wife had a little ceramic house, and I sort of made it my prayer house. It was about a 10 by 10 building. And I went out there one morning, and as soon as I walked in the door, I felt that, that devil walk in there, and I said, okay, devil, I, di I didn't invite you in. You invite yourself. Just have a seat. And, and I said, but the word says that every time I say the name of Jesus, you've got to bow your knee. And then it said, the devils believe also, and they trembled. So every time I say that there, the devils believe that there's one God, and they tremble. So every time I say that there's one God, you had to tremble. And I started praying, Lord Jesus, I know that you're one God. He was gone in 30 seconds. You know, you can fight that devil with the word of God. You can fight that devil with the word of God. I'm here to tell you today. But then listen to the last scripture. The devil leaveth him, and angels came to minister to him. If you want the angels to come minister to you, you have to resist the devil. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and draw, you know, and he will draw near to you. Resist Satan and he will flee from thee. And it's important that we understand these principles in our life. Um, in Matthew, you know, he, Jesus, in Matthew, the 26th chapter, Jesus, you know, he would, he, basically, he, he spent his days working. He spent his nights praying. And it, it got to the point one time the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because they knew that, that you know, the things that he was doing was a result of him praying many hours of the night. Um, and we go to Acts, the 10th chapter, and the second verse, uh, Acts the 10th chapter, in the second verse, it talks about Cornelius. Uh, listen to the description of Cornelius. And Saul, yet breathing threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired him letters from to Damascus to the synagogues that if any found this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto him. And he journeyed, he came in near to Damascus, and suddenly there came about him a... Uh, I'm reading in the wrong place. I do that sometimes, and, and our people forgive me. Thank God. <laughs> uh, there was a certain man in Acts 10 and 1. There was a certain man in, Car in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of a band called the Italian band. He was a devout man, he was one that feared God with all of his house. He gave much alms to the people, and he prayed always. But in, in, in the fifth verse, it says, Send now to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And then in, uh, uh, in verse 30, and Cornelius said, when Peter had got there, in four days ago I was fasting until this very hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. So, you know, he was fasting, so... 
it's a pattern in the scripture, you know, fasting and prayer that will draw you closer to God. If you really want to get close to God, you, you need to do that. Um, a friend of ours that's a pastor of a church, he told me a long time ago, he said, I fast seven days every year for our church. And so since I was back down again off the mountain, I decided I'm going to fast seven days. And I don't tell you that to brag because I hadn't been done it in a long time, so that took all the bragging rights away. But I can tell you this much. When you fast, you know, two or three days, or uh, actually the third day, most of the bad stuff goes away. But, but when you fast, it draws you closer to God more than anything that you can do. You know, it, it, I, I don't know what it is, but it draws you closer to God. And, I, and, and again, I got up off the mountain up on top of the mountain, and I still like it. And now I like for other people to get up there because I know that it's such a blessed life. Um, and it's important that we understand these things. And then I, and, and again, you know, slowly, and fortunately, unfortunately, there are mountains and valleys in our life. I don't care how spiritual we get, there are, there are, there are, there are valleys and mountaintops in our life. I thought about a a story about a little boy one time that he loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. His mother said, what do you want for Christmas? I mean, what do you want for lunch? I'm not nervous very much. <laughs> what do you want for lunch? He said, peanut butter and jelly. And uh, she come home at night, what do you want for dinner? Peanut butter and jelly. I'm sorry, you're not getting peanut butter and jelly. And this goes on for three or four days. And finally, he said, Mama, I could eat peanut butter and jelly every meal. I love peanut butter and jelly. She said, okay. I'll, okay, I'll do that. So he gets up the next morning. He had, had peanut butter and jelly on his for dinner. He said, yes. And he opened his lunch box and he got peanut butter and jelly. Yes. He come home at night. What's for supper, Mom? Peanut butter and jelly. You know, got up the next morning, what you want for breakfast? Peanut butter and jelly, mama. I told you I love peanut butter and jelly. This goes on for about four days. And she said, he comes home from one day afternoon and said, uh, what do you want for dinner? You, you want peanut butter and jelly? Mama, I don't know whether I ever want any more peanut butter and jelly or not. <laughs> so the bottom line is we need a spiritual we need, we need to have a balanced spiritual life. You know, even as we need to eat right, we need to have a balanced spiritual life in, in, our, in our life. Um, yeah, and after thinking about this, I realized, you know, that I needed three things in my life, you know, to stay close to God. I need to pray. I need to read the Bible every day. And I need... Uh, uh, and. Uh, I need to fast, and I'll be frank with you, this, this last year that I worked full time, it, it was hard for me, because it was hard for me to get up, but I still know that I need to do that, and I'm gradually, I'm getting back to where I need to be. Um, and we also need to be faithful in church attendance, in Isaiah uh, 58, and since we got, let's look at Isaiah 58 chapter, uh, it tells us that we need to be faithful to God. Isaiah 58, 58 and 13. If thou turn thy foot from the Sabbath day and from doing thine own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. That's tough. It's a lot easier to teach than it is to practice, I guarantee you. Then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon thy high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And then in Hebrews 10 and 25, it says, We don't need to be forsaken the assembly of ourselves together as, as some are. I know that there's been so many times that I would come to church, I'd be very tired. And when I left church, I was a lot more rested than I was when I, when I left to come to church. And coming to church is something about being in the fellowship of your brothers and sisters, that it strengthens you. You draw strength from your brothers and sisters when you come into the house of God. Besides that, you know, the song was asking, you know, will you come down and meet with us? God desires to meet with us. Um, and we also need to pay our tithes. 
Brother Hunt, I was shocked when you said you had an old statistic that said only 9% of the Christians only pay their tithe. I didn't know there was any other way. You know, I paid it. When we were picking cotton, my mom would say, you need to pay tithes, son. You know, we didn't make very much, but we still paid our tithes. I could stay there for a long time. And Malachi, Malachi 3 and 8, it says, Will a man rob God? But you have robbed me in tithes and in offering. And, and I'm not going to stay there much longer. Uh, that's not really my place. Um, and then we also need to be obedient to those that have rule over us. It's important. Samuel told, Samuel told Saul, Obedience is better than sacrifice. When we obey, it, it pleases God. When we please God, it, it helps us. Um, you know, when I look back on my life, my, my sister started to, and so I started doing all of it and, and you know, praying and reading the Bible and, and fasting, and, and I find that I have a lot closer walk with God on a consistent basis. But my sister, a few years ago, before she passed away, she started rattling our, our family tree, and we found out that in, in my family there's been preachers all the way back to 1850. There's been people in my family that had a great love for God. There's five boys in my family, and at one time or another, four of us have said that we feel like God has called us to preach. Um, and I know that my mother, you know, when I was growing up, she didn't go to church, but we lived 10 miles out of town, and, and this was before that McDonald was ever thought about being in, in business. But you know, we'd come home in the afternoon, she'd be sitting, on, sitting there with the Bible on her lap, and you'd, sometimes she'd have her eyes closed and her mouth would be moving. And, we knew, and I'd ask her many times to pray for me. I'd get up in the morning time, and, and the boys slept in the dining room without a door into the kitchen. She'd be in that kitchen, you know, with a flour sack dress on, cooking on a, on a wood stove, you know, and, and she would be singing like she was the Queen of Sheba. I can still hear her today. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, you know, and it. She's had an effect on our life. Every, it, just about all all of us children has had a love for God. Sometimes we get a little bit further away from God than, than we need to be. Um, and I have an uncle that that's an Assembly of God preacher. She told a story about that when he first started preaching that um, said that he was that he they was they was going to plot plant some potatoes and they had 12 rows and he said on Saturday they, had, they got six of them planted and they got all and it got dark on them and he told his wife he said well I'll I'll come out and plant them in the morning just when the sun comes up and we'll still be able to go to church they plant those potatoes and all of them come up and they looked as green as they could be when they plowed those potatoes up the rows that planted on on uh, on Saturday Saturday afternoon had a multitude of potatoes the rows that was planted on Sunday had zero potatoes and his son is a preacher, and his son's son is a preacher. Can I tell you that, you know, when we line up, Brother Bernard, somebody put something out on Facebook, said that when we, when we live in God's purpose, it releases God's provisions to us. Brother David Bernard put that out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we have realized that. My wife had a, she had one kidney, and she went into the hospital, and, the, and every doctor and every nurse would come in, I would tell them, she hold, has only one kidney, don't shut that kidney down. And they did, you know. And, and about the third day, I, uh, I got the feeling, that a scripture came to my mind, this sickness is not unto death. And about the fourth or fifth day, I felt it in my spirit. It said in James, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them lay, pray over them and lay hands on them and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So I called Brother Milligan, and I said, will you bring one more preacher and anointing oil and, and pray for my wife? And they did. And so about a couple of days went by, and, and nothing happened. And I told God, I said, okay, God, your word says call for the elders. I did. And pray for them. They did. I said, you got the ball. And about the 15th day, they put tubes. She had eight dialysis treatment, and they told her, you're going to have dialysis treatment all you like. And she kept saying, Doc. God's not going to let them have me, you know, God's going to heal me. And he put those tubes in there, permanent tubes, and he said, you just might well face it, you're going to have dialysis treatment all your life. The night after he put, the, put them in there, her, her kidney woke up. They drained almost three gallons of water off her. She has never 
had another dialysis treatment since then. God is able. God is able. When we live in God's purpose, it releases God's provisions for us. David Bernard put that there. I read it again. Um, when we was in the church a long time ago, we were without a pastor, and, and we done took two offerings in the church, and and um, one of the deacons said, we can't go back to the people anymore and ask them money. Everybody in here just got to give $500. And I had enough money, just barely enough money in my checking account, and I wrote a check for $500, and I, I pulled up out of the parking lot on to Airway Boulevard on the street, and I said, God, I can't afford to go to this church anymore. Your word said everything I'm going to give up and give up in your name, you're going to re replace it a hundredfold. Let me see you do your work now. And that same week, I had a man insured. And he, he, he sold his house, and he wanted to get a refund. And he said, by the way, can you write these three buses I got that uh, I charter out to singing groups? I, said, I can get you a quote. He liked the quote, and I went out there on Friday. He had three of his friends with him. It was a total of 10 buses, the total premium on it was $110,000, and the total commission was $10,500. On the way home, I'd cry for a little bit and repent, and then I'd, I would thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm going to read this again. When we live in God's purpose, it releases God's provision to us, and we need to understand that. And I wrote this while I was down at the office where I go and stay some, and when I, I was driving home, it was like God almost slapped me, slapped me in. He said, go look at Genesis and what, what God told Adam. You know, he went looking for Adam. And the song said tonight, will you come down? And, and God went looking for Adam. You know, I, I believe with all my heart, there's not a parent in here that does not like to talk to their children. And even in the beginning, the first thing that he did when he created man and woman, he went and he communicated with them. He came looking for them. He couldn't find them. He said, where are you? I wonder tonight how many times he comes to us and says, where are you? God still desires to have fellowship with you and with me. Thank you for coming tonight.